I'm Dan. And I'm Alex. And welcome back to On Air. I'm exhausted today. How are you feeling, Alex? Why are you... St- what a way to start off the podcast, <laughs> you know? I'm ready to say happy Wednesday. Welcome all. Thank you for your questions. We're, and you, you're just, like, setting the tone from your sleepiness from the get-go. Why? <laughs> yeah. Why are you so tired? No, it's just I landed at 1 a.m. yesterday. It took me an hour to get back, so... It's, yeah, and then, you know, I have to get up early to record the podcast on a Wednesday morning. Just but let everybody that's the only know, thing it I is, would get up it for. is by no means early. It is 10.50 <laughs> in the morning. Oh, my God. We, we said we were going to discuss what you what, what you did to me on Friday morning, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. okay, no, let's get to it straight away. Well, let's. I don't know so, why you're sounding so confident. You were in the wrong. So Alex texts me on Friday morning at 8.30 a.m. his time with some news. And I I just want to discuss it. I don't want to just text. So I call him and Alex is right, outraged. Pause. Pause. So Friday in the Middle East is a weekend, right? Not, Friday not in Saturday. the whole Middle East. Sorry, 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 sorry. Friday in much of the... Gulf part of the Middle East is a weekend, all right? The UAE and other places being the exception. But for example, Qatar, Friday and Saturday is the weekend. That's how it is in in many places. So, yeah, I send Dan, you know, a nice piece of news from from one of the networks at 8.30 in the morning because, you know, I'm up and I I see it and I forward it to him. That is not an open invitation (laughs) to call me at 8.30 on a Friday how dare he? I I was horrified when I saw his name. I answered, I said, Tim, this better be good. <laughs> Listen, it if you text someone, that means you're available to call unless you say otherwise. Like I'm in a meeting and I'm sn- I'm sneakily texting you. Otherwise, it's fine to call in in my book. So anyway, we had a nice conversation, didn't we, at eight thirty a.m. No, Your it voice was outrageous. Was all raspy it was in morning. <laughs> yeah, okay. Ish. Morning voice, yeah. Because again, you were calling on a weekend at 8 30. See, I should have just pressed decline, right? It was in the interest <laughs> of everyone. Instead, I answered and I said to you, How dare you? And then go ahead. What do you have to tell me? And you're like, oh, I just want to chat. I'm like, what the? <laughs> this is. No, okay. Absolutely not. And the fact that you think I should have covered myself by saying, Hey, Dan, here's a link of, you know, a piece of news, but don't call me because, and, and a whole list of reasons, you're sick. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have some great stories from the past few days, which are the reason I'm tired. I've been all over Europe. I mean, I flew to and from Europe, but then I traveled around in Europe. And I, for like the second time in two weeks... I took one of the first morning departures from Heathrow. So you remember a couple of weeks ago, I flew BA to Rome. Yep. This time I flew BA to Amsterdam and guess which gate I had. See, at this, at this point, I would like to sincerely thank my friends at British Airways for once again <laughs> assigning him gate Alpha 10. That's the bus <laughs> gate that I put in as a request every time Dan flies. Thank you uh, to the chief executive's office, to those that work for him, and to the valuable staff members of British Airways for doing that for me. It comfort and warms my heart that Dan is on a bus at 5.30 in the morning being shuttled to an A320. Am I right? A319. A319. A3 oh, my God, they really did pull out all the stops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, you couldn't have like scripted it better because I was like, yeah, you know, last time was Rome. This time it's Amsterdam. There's no way this can also be a bus gate. We just joked about this. It's not going to happen. I get to the airport. Of course, the gate was not announced. One interesting thing I noticed is that every gate that was announced and actually mo- so I'm just checking a photo I took here of like the first 30 minutes of departures, every single flight. I see Barcelona, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Madrid, Brussels, Newcastle, all B and C gates. Yes, that first wave very often is. I think I've told you before, like if I do that first Malaga flight, it's almost always now a a B or a C gate. And of course, they have to publish the gate very early on the flight information um, boards. In for order for passengers to, to, yeah, for, for those gates, in order for passengers to take it seriously and get going because it, it's so far. Maybe they underestimate the journey. 
Also, did you notice how typically when those flights open for boarding, within seconds it switches to flight closing just to make mm. people go? Interesting. I so why do they do that? I mean, to me, the obvious explanation is that the A gates are very busy in the morning when they they have a bunch of European departures at like seven a.m. But yeah. many wa- long haul flights are landing at seven seven thirty eight. So they can put all the earliest short haul flights at those wide body gates at the C and yeah. B gates, and then they leave and a wide body pulls in. So that's that exactly point, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. So at that point, I'm like, all right, well, my gate isn't showing yet, so it must be an A gate. Good, good for me. <laughs> then I go to the lounge and I go, <laughs> oh, and they have to reprint my boarding pass, and then I'm like, uh, you know, tunnel vision on the gate as I see A ten. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, this cannot be real. And of course, uh, again, it wasn't one of those gates that's right next to the terminal. It was yeah. by Terminal 3 again. Beautiful. So beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful British Airways. Yeah, that's great. Well, anyway, I had a great crew. They were super friendly and casual. And landed. How long was your flight? 45 minutes. Super, super quick and fun. Okay. We landed on the Polderbahn, which is... I think that's the name, right, of the runway that's really, so. really far from the airport yeah. in Amsterdam. And if you've ever landed there, it's quite fun because you're just landing among fields. And then yeah. you slowly taxi. Actually, you taxi very fast, but the progress is very slow yeah. of getting to the airport. And pretty much every flight ends up taxiing for about 20 minutes from the landing runway to the terminal which you- is also a bit of a like uh feeling because when yeah. i have done that i'm always thinking uh this is as long as the flight yeah <laughs> like, from you know, london it's literally from london, yes I'm like, mm, we have been on the aircraft now for as much time as we were airborne except we're still not at the gate so yeah <laughs> it is an idea is that's not ideal when you're coming from somewhere so close but i i've i can accept it when where is i coming from somewhere in africa and I flew KLM. Oh, maybe I remember. Rwanda or something? Maybe maybe coming back from Rwanda. Yeah. No, but no, I think that was Brussels. Anyway, it was somewhere. And um, like that, it's kind of okay. But from London, it's a bit, oh, God. It's <laughs> yeah. just, it's but I, for flying. <laughs> I, I mean, I have to say that Skip Hall Airport is very fun. Besides that thing, like yeah. all the runways in kind of intersecting. And there's maintenance on one of the runways right now, which is leading to some delays. But... Right they've they've made it into a whole thing so they've built like a platform where you can go and watch the construction that that to me is so skip hole because it's like one of the plane spotting airports in the world and one thing i forgot to say is you know we talk about sometimes amazing british airways pilots Mm -hmm. this flight had those pilots who want to give you every little update that only us av geeks appreciate you know everyone else is like why are you talking on and on and on but, you know, he had to give every detail about our, our altitude, our speed, the runway number we're departing on and landing on. And then, you know, as we got to the gate, he had to sincerely apologize that we pulled in two minutes late due to the exceedingly long taxi in Amsterdam. So, yeah, it was all quite a bit of fun. The I saw on Twitter recently, actually, I think it was just yesterday, a, a British Airways pilot PA bingo. And it's a bingo card that you can have for when listening to the pilot's PA. And it has all of the quotes that they all say, I guess almost like across the board, because I think I've heard every single one. One of them is that in the PA, they'll say, um, just the last bits and pieces of paperwork to finish off. Yes. That's that one. Okay. The other one is, uh, thank you all for boarding so promptly. <laughs> um, uh, also, a quick mention of the British Airways seatbelt policy <laughs> about keeping <laughs> yeah. the seatbelts fastened. And when the when uh, they finally arrive at the uh, gate at the other end, a quick PA that says, "Well, here we are. We have." <laughs> you know, I read these and I was thinking, "I love it." That is the language of the BA pilot. That <laughs> you fluent, I guess, after a few years. Yeah, it, yeah, I really love that. Anyway. Have you been to Amsterdam in the past few years? It's been a while. Actually, I haven't been to Amsterdam since the pandemic. So it's mm. funny, isn't it? That's how we always like consider time yeah. now. So where it feels only like a few years ago, I'm thinking, well, the pandemic started four years ago this month. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, so it was 2019 was the last time I was in Amsterdam. Okay. I mean, it's such a beautiful place, like genuinely, but it is 
so shocking walking around the center of town and yeah. seeing all the overly sexual things everywhere, seeing the coffee shops that obviously people go to for other things than coffee. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. and the, the ads also like, you know, you travel in Asia, the Middle East, and sometimes you get back to Europe and you're like, this is a billboard in front of the, you know, everyone passes this old, young, male, yeah, female, yeah. everyone. And it's like people in a, the most scantily clad, like girls in some bikini ad. And yeah. you're just like, whoa, I'm almost like, have I become conservative to the point where I'm like, this is a bit much. Can we tone it down? <laughs> I think so maybe you have become jarring. because, because we've spoken about that before, haven't we? I think the more time that you spend out of, for example, like the more time you spend in the Middle East or in some parts of Asia and so on, I, I don't know. I do because, because I remember speaking to you about this very thing that there are certain European cities we go to and I'm like, my God, you know, d did they get dressed this morning? <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I don't know if I would have had that same remark like eight years ago. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's funny. It, it, I mean, it, it just used to be normal, but I feel like now you just, mm. you react to things more Maybe. strongly when, when you see it out of context. And oh my God, I think there are more British lads in Amsterdam than yeah. there are in the entire UK. <laughs> but they but they don't want them there, do they? No. They, they were launching different campaigns to stop the... In the UK, it's called a stag do, which is the yeah. equivalent to an American bachelor party. Yeah. 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 Um, they they were launching different campaigns to kind of stop this because they, um, they basically did a discouragement campaign. So it wasn't a, a ban... But it was kind of this this campaign that was focusing on the fact that if you are young British and want a messy weekend, go somewhere else. That was the that was the motive of the uh, of the campaign. Yeah, and it it does make sense because living somewhere where there are so many people who just come to like mess around cannot be fun. And it is interesting with places. So they're discouraging that type of tourism. Of course, we've also mm. spoken about how the government is trying to limit the number of flights. So although tourism is obviously a huge part of the Dutch economy, there's several steps on several, di several different le levels for sustainability or for, you know, to help the local environment in other ways than just pollution as well um, <laughs> going on in the Netherlands. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah, and that was... So the Netherlands had this bizarre tweet, didn't they? Or Amsterdam Airport, Schiphol rather, had, had that bizarre tweet when the government had said that the cap that they had proposed on limiting flights at the airport was actually no longer going to be implemented when they had previously outlined, which you think the airport would have celebrated, but instead they were saying, this is very bad news. And everyone <laughs> yeah. was like, huh? You don't want growth? <laughs> You're yeah. opposing your own economic, you know, prosperity hopes? I mean, it was a little bit bizarre, but they have their own motives for seemingly want to, wanting to appear absolutely aligned with the state's climate change goals rather than their own goals of you know growth aspirations and so on yeah yeah speaking of amsterdam and, and those limitations one airline that was going to be limited or impacted by it was jet blue but yeah. now now that those restrictions were removed jet blue can continue serving amsterdam this summer but that brings us to some nice news about jet blue's just announced shake up if you will of their network because We've spoken here before as well about um, JetBlue and Spirit's merger being called off, Spirit Airlines being probably the closest equivalent to Ryanair, or maybe that's Frontier, but one of the closer equivalents to Ryanair in the US. They were going to merge with JetBlue, but that was called off. And now JetBlue yeah. is trying to find ways to survive and return to profitability. So as part of that, they've announced all types of cuts including pulling out of most of their destinations in South America. So that includes Bogota, Lima, Quito. They're also greatly reducing service to 
a place that breaks my heart. <laughs> They're cutting a lot of routes to LA, Alex. <laughs> I saw this. I saw this. And you know, this is it's it's not so often that we see airlines take drastic action to to do this like financial tidy up. We very rarely see that that tidy up take place. But this is JetBlue, as you say, emerging now, leaving behind the extremely costly what ended up being a bit of a mess with the whole spirit merger that now is, is not going ahead and also them trying to focus on stronger markets after years of losing money in, in in different places plus don't forget they're having to ground some of their aircraft just like Wizz Air and many other operators around the world because they have Pratt and Whitney engines so this is going to help them help them there they as you said, a lot of South America going, even Lima, Peru, which you know I, I was a bit surprised at because th- these are these are hubs, but uh, yeah. but there we go, they're out pulling out as of, as well, Kansas City, Missouri or misery, and uh, <laughs> different different uh, routes from Los Angeles, which is devastating, including Seattle. So uh, you know yeah, the Boeing Seattle, link San there, Francisco, San Francisco, Miami. Vegas, Miami, yeah. ending ending flights between Fort Lauderdale and Atlanta. Austin, uh, Nashville, New Orleans, yeah. Salt Lake City, and even service between New York and Detroit. It's, you know, it's unusual that we see a sledgehammer taken to a route network anywhere, yes. let alone on an airline that is as nimble and as agile as JetBlue, you know? Yeah, but that thank you for giving that context because it that's exactly the point. It's so rare for an airline to just be like, okay, we're just going to cancel like 20, 30 routes today we're announcing it you know that's that's a huge deal and i guess maybe we should discuss partly why this is happening for example why are they pulling out of lax lax is a really difficult airport for airlines to compete in for a few different reasons first of all it's one of the only cities in the u.s and you know comparing it to new york where you have two air two long-haul airports newark and jfk and lax you have one and you have all three big U.S. carriers, American, Delta, and United, offering hubs there. So they're flying long haul and trying to compete with each other. So right. there's already brand loyalty fierce to these three airlines. Southwest also has a huge presence at LAX. So there's just so much competition from brands that have a ton of loyalty. And JetBlue is really a small player on the West Coast. So... For them to be able to compete, it has to be on price. They're not offering mint on most of these routes besides their LAX to Miami, which is being cut. So, you know, it's just not a favorable position for them to be in. And what's so interesting is that even if they wanted to grow at LAX, it's not really possible because so many airports in the U.S., although they're massive compared to many other parts of the world, are pretty restricted in terms of slots and specifically at LAX gate space is a huge problem even though they have over 150 gates which might not sound like a lot but Atlanta the world's busiest airport only has about 190 so LAX is not that far behind but even there it's impossible for JetBlue to get more gates and hence compete more more effectively with other airlines. Good context. And it's true. You know, they've they've been able to recognize where their strengths and weaknesses are. And it's very rare, as we said, for an airline to be forthcoming about that and to not, you know, overthink or, or just operate endlessly to places that are simply not profitable. But JetBlue have to do this now. They have they have suffered with the losses, not least because of the, the losses incurred by the deal that has been killed by the Biden administration with Spirit. And so now is the time to uh, aspire towards financial health again. And most airlines, remember, around the world are making more money right now than they have ever made. Never mind just since the pandemic, but but in history, we're seeing record profits everywhere. And that is the way in which travel, the travel resurgence kind of occurred after the pandemic. But it's also the way in which, you know, demand has solidified now across the board rather than just localized or in key areas and airlines are expanding they're reinvesting we're seeing forward investments everywhere which is a nice link into some other news that ha- that occurred over the last week we have many questions about this and i trust many of the listeners uh, knew that we were going to be covering it but uh, here in Doha, Qatar Airways Group CEO, Badr Almir, if you remember, he is the gentleman that took over uh, the seat of Akbar al-Bakr 
in November last year, so just months ago. He was formerly the top of Hamad International Airport. That was very much his baby in terms of the expansion, the orchard, and everything that came with that expansion. It wasn't just the area itself, but it was the fuel farm. It was the new baggage handling facility. It was the gates, the remote stands, and so on and so on. He's now at the top of Qatar Airways. He sits down with CNBC just a few days ago for his first ever global TV interview, and he came with the goods. He has announced a new Q suite, an updated version of the existing world's best business class, widely considered, which is going to be revealed at Farnborough. So that's not too far away at all. Um, there's also a new first class coming. So he has publicly committed to first class, which is a U-turn from the previous CEO. Uh, Badr Almir told CNBC that he sees there is a demand for it. He was citing the fact that they always have, you know, premium uh, demand on certain routes where first class absolutely makes sense. I mean, I think we can both agree there that, for example, Dan, on a London flight now on the A380s, it, first is a given that there it would at least be so how many seats do you have you have eight seats currently on an a318 first i think on almost every flight minimum of six of them are uh, are occupied yeah that's a, that's amazing I, I i find it interesting that so many airlines are so intent on cutting first class because when i check there's many routes where first class does really really well not yeah. to mention that premium demand is just increasing and increasing Flying long haul first class is still way cheaper than chartering a private jet. So to yeah. me, it's like, I mean, I think we all wish they would keep it around. So this this is really exciting news. And if one airline home market specifically has a demand for first class, just like the other Gulf states, it's Qatar. I mean, yeah. you have London as one of the most favoured or the most favoured route of the Qatari market, for example. Now, they only make up less than 5% of travelers on their own national airline but the overwhelming majority are premium travelers they are flying in business and in first class cabins so places like london paris of course it makes sense so it's an interesting development that he had said he is publicly uh, and you know confirmed to be committed to first there is a new first class cabin in the works it's going to debut on the incoming new aircraft that are on order already. So that suggests it's initially going to be on the new Boeing 777X aircraft that are currently on, on order from Qatar Airways. We don't have an, an exact timeline, but he was very forthcoming with this interview. And for that, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more from him, uh, from him there. And the headline of the interview, of course, he has released an RFP. So that's essentially uh, a request for a proposal where you go to the manufacturers and you say, come to me with your best proposed package for a large aircraft order from both Airbus and Boeing. So now Airbus and Boeing have to put together their best proposals and ultimately one of the manufacturers will win a large aircraft order from Qatar Airways Almir ending this interview by confirming that this is not simply Qatar Airways anymore. This is Qatar Airways 2.0. Which Love I think it. was really interesting to mark a kind of new era. Interestingly, the full interview isn't out yet. All of that was just a few clips. The full interview is out next week. So mm. that will be interesting to see, you know, with context, how these conversations came about. Yeah. So what is your prediction for the big aircraft order, if you had to give one? I think that there there is a likely scenario whereby it could be split between both. I just think that history has taught us that it's sensible if you're able to hedge your bets with both. At the same time, there is a chance that they will just go with the better offer and it's whoever can offer that better offer. And I think, and I given think that, we know who that, is in, in a place well, where they need to give a better offer, no? Well, yeah. I mean, look, there are reasons why Boeing may secure that order because perhaps there are greater discounts involved, maybe, given the, the, the climate that Boeing is uh, facing right now. Perhaps Airbus order is perceived to be uh, a little more reliable, maybe. Maybe they're able to, you know, in the in the way in which their relationship has now resumed with, with Qatar Airways and, of course, a new leadership, maybe that will play a role in terms of what Airbus is able to offer. Don't forget, Qatar Airways is still waiting to receive some A350s, but also A321 aircraft. They're, they're, they're going to be LRs, the long-range variant. Of course, on the Boeing side, it's got 777X on order. So it's not like... 
either of the two manufacturers emerge as a clear winner at the moment. I would say yeah. quite the opposite. It's really anyone's game and it's in their interest to put together the best proposal for the new group chief executive to make that decision on with his board members and hopefully something we can be announcing on the podcast very soon. Yeah, there was qu quite an interesting comment, just a small one made in passing during the interview that I was like, hmm, this is quite indicative because he said at one point that Airbus had basically called him up and said, hey, we have two earlier delivery slots for E350s. So remember, obviously, infamously, there was quite a bit of bad blood there between Airbus and Qatar with the E350. Their orders ended up being canceled, then reinstated, but for several years down the line. But now, apparently, Airbus has offered at least for two of them to push it forward a bit and offer earlier slots, which I guess is good news for Qatar. It was interesting, and I think that was when he was pressed in the interview, wasn't he, on the relationship with suppliers, and he was just trying to demonstrate that there is always that open dialogue. Now, many airline CEO go on TV and say this, but as you say, he gave a real world example. He said, for example, Airbus just communicated to us that some aircraft are able to be delivered earlier than we thought, you know, which is great. And and that was that kind of example of how, you know, it's a dynamic relationship always between the manufacturer and the airline. Also, he noted and he was quite clear where he wanted to expand. And Dan Murphy, the CNBC presenter who was anchoring the interview, he pressed him specifically on this and he said, okay, that's where you want to expand, but where do you want to expand today if you could expand right now? And Badr Almir, the CEO, said, China, India, Australia, Japan, Korea, and a few others, which I also thought was really interesting because China, of course, you know, pretty much closed for most of the last few years and now of course a place with with always solid demand qr wanting capacity there india everybody wants capacity to india india is quite protectionist as we know it's not so open in terms of having open skies australia is this going to be a new era of the relationship between Qatar Airways and Australia, given the recent complications where Australia denied it without reason, denied Qatar's expansion? Remember, we spoke about it on a previous episode. And then Japan and Korea, who are not, you know, they're not famous, if you like, in the industry for being protectionist. But I can see why there would be room for growth those flights do do very well. I mean, what did you think when, were you surprised to see that ultimately Europe wasn't on there when he when he yeah. said, you know, where do you want to expand right now? <laughs> I guess your demand is being quite adequately met in Europe besides to Gothenburg, of course. <laughs> but I will say I was surprised that he said China because Emirates was serving China, Beijing and Shanghai, and maybe Guang, Guangzhou with A380s. Mm. but they removed them for the spring season. I'm not sure if they're going to... I'm just checking now. Actually, they won't even be serving China in the summer with A380s. So that to me says, all right, Emirates is decreasing capacity, but somehow Qatar Airways sees there's so much demand that they want to increase it. I guess that could come down to, you know, I'm just checking the route map now from Dubai to China. I, I'd say there's service to almost 10 cities or maybe even more, maybe a dozen cities in China direct mm. from Dubai on all types of Chinese carriers. So I guess the competition is much stronger there versus Qatar Airways mainly focusing on connections when it comes to Chinese passengers. And I guess it's just a completely, it's, it's tough to compare Emirates and Qatar sometimes because the target demographic can actually be quite different depending on the route. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of competition, let's actually play you a clip directly from the interview where Badr Almir was specifically asked about competition on Riyadh Air. This is the, of course, the Saudi newcomer that hasn't launched yet, but is always perceived and portrayed to be this kind of threat to the other Middle East airlines, despite the fact it doesn't it doesn't exist at the moment. And of course, you remember we interviewed the CEO, Tony Douglas. Let's hear what Badr Almir had to say when they asked if Riyadh Air is a threat. When it comes to Riyadh, as well, we welcome competition, but we don't feel pressured 
عمري of uh, being a new player in the market. You know, we have established our company for many, many years. We have established our uh, uh, base when it comes to our customers. We have loyal customers that will always fly Qatar Airways and will not accept to fly any, with anybody else. And the number of clients, uh, loyal clients, keep growing. So for me, the way I see it, pressure is on Riyadh Air to come in a market where there is, they will have to compete with the best of the best. There's no pressure on us. That's an interesting spin on where the pressure is lying. I mean, we heard Tony Douglas on our podcast say that they are primarily focusing on passengers to and from Saudi Arabia. They're not trying to be a hub connector. So in but a did sense, we believe that? Did we believe that? <laughs> Let's be honest. Well, no, they're obviously going to rely on connecting traffic, but Absolutely. You know, as it's I going said, to core, it's going to form the core fundamentals of that business, whether he, whether he says that right now or not. I mean, yeah. there, there, there is no demand for point to point Saudi Arabia that justifies a big global airline at the moment. Yes, they have big growth ambitions, as we said. But I think what Badr said is, is correct in that the pressure is very much on them. We always keep, you know, Emirates and Qatar Airways and Etihad, they keep being asked, oh, what about that? You know, are, you know, coming up. It's like, well, this is an airline coming into play with the heaviest of global aviation giants, you know? Yeah. And these airlines have had years, decades to build their brands, to build trust. Meanwhile, yeah. you have Saudi Arabia trying to build trust, but Riyadh Air will definitely have an uphill battle compared to, you know, I, I think Qatar and Emirates and Etihad can sort of lean back and watch it unfold. They all have great products. So, for now, I wouldn't be sweating it too much. Yeah, there's, there's, we've had this, this just brings me to something we were speaking about in terms of how we measure demand and how you and I can perceive demand by ourselves. I have had, I don't know if you've had, I've had about four or five messages via Instagram from a variety of different people who have asked, how is it that we are able to refer to how busy a flight is mm -hmm. so th th they're asking how do we know so for example one guy said hey you mentioned how um uh, etihad flights to london you know in the morning uh, are still half empty he said i'm just curious how you know that then then there was another guy he's a diplomat in an embassy in warsaw and he asked the same kind of thing how is it that we are able to say with accuracy uh, as to how busy a flight is so do you want to explain how we know well, there are, there are a few different ways. There are websites where you can check. For example, anyone can use expertflyer.com. And if you get a premium membership, you can basically check how many seats are available for sale on pretty much any flight and airline. It doesn't really work for low cost carriers, but anything else, you can see how many uh, seats are left in each fare class. And then you can also check the seat map. I think what Alex and I do most I can spend a full afternoon just for fun checking seat maps. So for example, one thing I love about United and the United app is that you can check flight status of pretty much any flight that they operate two days in the past, currently in the air, and even one day ahead. And there you can see the seat maps of every single flight. So I can go through like the entire departure wave from Newark in an e <laughs> like in one evening on the United app to check the loads of of the flights as they are in flight. So you can see very accurate representations on the seat map. The same goes for Qatar Airways. You can view their seat maps until the minute the flight is scheduled to depart. So those yeah. types of things give great indications on what the loads are and you know i remember and it's COVID, really helpful i just have to say it? i remember during saying, covid yeah. like checking that was when i that re i really opened my eyes to this because mm. i would check like one minute before departure and i would be like is there something wrong with this or why is every single seat empty you know th those yeah. are some crazy moments yeah and so you can have a, you can get a really accurate idea as to how busy the flight is based on how many tickets uh, are being sold and how full the flight is in terms of seat allocation and so on so it's kind of taking both pieces of that data it's also really helpful i i'm like dan i can be sitting on an aircraft refreshing 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 but until i know that the last person has boarded because i can figure out if the seat next to me for example is going to stay vacant or not yeah and 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 the system is as is updating in real time 
it's probably the best. How, isn't it five dollars a month or something? Yeah, yeah, I think it's I mean, about it's, maybe fifty dollars, or maybe it's a hundred dollars a year for Expert Flyer, actually. But you can check seat maps for free. It's just that I think you're limited to like five searches a day or something, which pales in comparison to how many I can sometimes do. Well, I don't sit there for fun checking other random flights. I mean, I'm, I would do it to take an idea of something that I'm investigating or flying myself. But we've spoken previously about how Dan spares his, uh, how Dan spends his spare time. Excuse me, and that's not a subject we need to revisit. <laughs> that oh, is research. Me. Sorry, Dan. If you have any uh, queries or any follow up to that, you can call me again at eight thirty a.m. on a Friday, <laughs> perhaps, and see if I answer this time. That is a hundred percent research, okay? And next time I'm doing it, I will call you whatever time of day when I realize, all right, United is operating a triple seven three hundred between Brussels and Washington DC. I wonder how Who well cares? they can fill that in a February. Who and then cares? I see, oh, oh wow, it is quite full. You should care because it reflects on supply care. and demand pretty accurately. I do, I do care. I just it's just when you said, you know, United, I was like oh. <laughs> <laughs> like we need to discuss no united we spoke in depth about last week and uh, this week they've actually had to come for you remember that list i went through last week on last week's episode yeah well this week the united ceo has come forward to reassure their staff that like everything's fine do not worry these are just headlines you know this is the normal working activity of an airline in terms of having the odd maintenance mishap here and there yeah, it's uh, an ongoing thing, but there wasn't much to update since we were pretty ahead of the game going through that long list during the Q&A last week. Exactly. Do you because because I posted a short and a reel about this and people have all types of different theories. You know, people love to get political about why this is happening. I think the explanation is pretty clear, but do you think there's, you know, any <laughs> obvious explanation to why actually their explanation isn't so clear as to why it's only united but yeah i have no answer to to that part as to why it's only united i know why boeing's reputation is is in tatters right now in terms of you know the the public awareness i'm seeing it everywhere and you've got key people discussing how oh boeing are facing a crisis uh, and then they, then they talk about something isolated that happened you know at one airline on one day in one circumstance a week ago as if it's a boeing problem when nine times out of ten i mean if there was a higher ratio i'd go for it but nine times out of ten it's not a boeing issue they are simply linking anything that happens with a boeing aircraft now globally remember there are over twelve thousand flights in the commercial air travel world per day Anything that happens globally that involves a Boeing, which makes up, I mean, half of the world's aircraft fleet, if not a little bit more, there are over 10,000 Boeing aircraft in service with the current issues that Boeing is facing, which actually are to do with production quality issues that we've spoken in depth about. That is not a sensible link to make. And that is the link that most of the media is making. And that's why we're getting messages from cousins and relatives far and wide saying, hey, you know, is it all right that I'm flying on a 737, you know, an ordinary 737 tomorrow when they've always flown a 737, never thought about it. And now they're questioning it because they're just seeing Boeing, Boeing, Boeing. And I, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, even some of the podcasts that are my usuals, I haven't been able to listen to because I'm thinking you are linking two things that are not supposed to be linked. A 787 that has been in service for eight years and, and has, for example, an oil leak has nothing to do with Boeing quality issues in Seattle or in South Carolina and so on. Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. And I think that, you know, the reason it's partly that United is getting so much media attention because yeah. of the Boeing thing that makes people be like, what's going on at United? Then, of course, United does have an older fleet. It has one of the oldest fleets in the world. It is true. also one of the biggest airlines in the world. So combine all those factors there are going to be incidents but if we just look at how they've been handled everything has been handled incredibly well no one has even been injured so you know you need to take one step at a time when it comes to this yeah. and see that yeah. united is still an incredibly safe airline it's just that now is a bad time to be having any sort of incident because every airline is under a microscope and and imagine imagine we knew it was you know, terrible for you, Dan, to, to eat chocolate, right? 
and you eat chocolate throughout the day all the time but nobody cares but then suddenly it's a it's a trend that you know the whole world knows dan's not supposed to eat chocolate so then suddenly we start getting alerts every time you eat chocolate and so suddenly it appears on the surface that you are eating so much chocolate despite you not not supposed to be eating chocolate when actually you're still eating chocolate at the same rate you were previously the difference is we were not reporting on it previously yeah that's what's happening right now and you know and i hope you enjoying your chocolate because I like chocolate. So, I, yeah, so, I feel like you're talking yeah. about yourself because I feel I like 50% of what you eat is chocolate. It's not 50% of what I eat. How dare you? It's 75, sorry. No, it's not. I eat uh, a, a very, very well-balanced <laughs> variety of breakfast, brunch, lunch, dinner, and so on. In addition to all of that, God, I love chocolate. Specifically, Swiss chocolate. Mm. Love it. Have you seen Wonka? No, still I haven't seen it. I, okay, I was. I, I didn't skeptical. see it because I I starred as the main character. So oh, I, wait! I, people I say you look to. like Timothy Chalamet. No, they don't. Well, I mean, a few people sent it to me when Wonka <laughs> first came out. But <laughs> okay. By the way, I saw Dune two. Great movie. Also, you should check that out in IMAX. Do I need to see Dune one? No, you don't. We went with Oscar's mom. She had not seen Dune one. And she enjoyed Dune 2. Dune 2 was so much better, in my opinion. So so because Oscar's mum liked it, I will. No, I mean, I th- I'm i pretty sure yes, because out of all people to like it, <laughs> <laughs> someone who has not seen part one, someone who couldn't care less okay, about that type okay. of stuff. Um, but yeah, just make sure you watch it in IMAX. I also watched Wonka, and I was like, that was about a couple of months ago, but I was so skeptical. And it is kind of a children's movie, but sometimes I love right. a good children's movie where the plot is very simple and you can just sort of enjoy it for what it is so too did you good see what Timothy miriam margulies the woman the the lady from who was in harry potter did you see what she said this week about how anyone who is an adult right now should not like or should just let go of harry potter because it's for kids and she's like angered the harry potter no. world who is this uh, yes. uh she's she's a Who does she very, play? very, very funny actress, comedian. In uh, she's Australian, but she's mostly in in the UK. Miriam Margulies, you, you would recognize okay, I'm her. I'm googling. She is oh, always she, she on plays... late night talk shows, making blunders and swearing, and you know, just doing naughty things that she shouldn't be doing. But she she has urged adult Harry Potter fans to grow up, and Harry Potter fans are. are outraged <laughs> by this but do you, you like harry, harry potter? potter i have never seen a single <gasps> harry potter movie ever get out i know why always say, i don't know i don't know i've just never seen it and and have I've you read the books it, uh i read the first book when i was a kid which was philosopher stone right yeah <laughs> so i read i read the first book but i have never seen any of the movies and you know when this always comes up? For example, the last time I was with the delegation from Philippine Airlines, right? These lovely team of Filipinas. They were all, oh, your accent, oh, oh Harry Potter. And I was like, they said, oh, you must be obsessed with it. Or, you know, stereotyping, right? And I, I said, I've never seen it. They were like, what? Yeah. Alex, that is illegal for a Brit to not have seen Harry Potter. It's... Why would you not ever have watched it? It's on so many airlines. It's on so many airlines, and every single time I see it, I think, not today, another day. <laughs> like you know, like because I just, uh, I don't know. And you know, when someone tells you you have to watch it, that voice yeah. in the back of your head makes a note, a mental note of right. I must do my best to avoid that movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Somehow. so that's how you've been with Veep all this time. Now I get it. <laughs> No, I sat and watched the first episode of Veep last week, by the way. Okay. It's on OSN wow, here. last yeah. week. Yeah. It's only a 20-minute episode, isn't it? Also? Yeah. So something it's like that, yeah. Not a commitment like Harry Potter, but... No. You, I only watched one episode. The fact you were... Uh, yeah, thank you. But the fact you were outraged by me not having been to Disneyland, and you have not even seen Harry Potter. I know. This is jail. Disney's amazing. I mean, the roller coasters, Space Mountain, Thunder Mountain... The Guess what? One, the, Harry the Potter is amazing too. I am an yeah. adult and I like Harry Potter, okay? Well, so that explains a lot. That to me. actress can sit down. 
Okay. And with that, let's sit down for some Q&A. <laughs> let's do it. Okay, so Dan asks, what is wrong with Alex for not having seen Harry Potter? I agree. Liar. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a question from... I only see the username. I guess it's Cash. Um, what... Oh, can we talk about the prospects for the E380? It seems like multiple airlines are now reinvesting in fresh business class seats. Um, so are airlines now committed to it for the longer term? I think the picture is still split, isn't it, between those that are committed and those that are not. I think those that were not committed to the A380 have already got rid of them and are in the process of getting rid of them. So I think the A380s that you see around today are pretty much here to stay. Emirates, definitely here to stay. They're practically drowning in them. Qatar Airways, the CEO confirmed in the CNBC interview that we spoke about that they are now here to stay for the foreseeable, at least until new aircraft from Airbus and Boeing arrive. British Airways are going to be launching a new first class on their A380, which means they are reinvesting. Lufthansa and business. And business. Lufthansa are introducing new cabins on the A380 as well. God knows when, because the timeline is all over the place. God knows if it's upstairs and downstairs, or downstairs only and upstairs and so on, because that's also been a development. So with that, I would say that many of the main A380 players that you've seen around today are airlines that are committing to them. That doesn't mean they're reinvesting, but it means that they're going to stick around for a bit longer. What do you think? Yeah, it's just... It's those few airlines. It's about a handful. Singapore Airlines, Qantas, Lufthansa, British Airways, Emirates that I feel are truly committed to the aircraft. Lufthansa now is truly committed to it. Etihad, I feel, is a bit like, mm, never know where they're going to go. If they're suddenly going to be like, we're bringing back all our other A380s or if they're happy with just a few. Qatar Airways, I feel, yeah, he said they're going to stay around, but watch the first 777X get delivered and I th think that spells the end for the Qatar well, he Airways said A3. He, he was quite, uh, I disagree. He was very detailed in explaining in the interview how the A380 can achieve what other airline jets simply cannot in terms of operations to congested airports like Heathrow. He said the only way that we can fly more passengers in is on aircraft like the A380 and no other airline jet does that in terms of capacity. So he, he said he likes it, he's committed to it, and when they kind of pressed on, okay, but until when? He said, until we're in a position where we no longer need them. So I, I would disagree. I don't think it's going to be the first, but I think once there is a solid new fleet of wide bodies, like, you know, a solid new fleet of 777X, if it ever gets certified, and other aircraft, then I think then we will see the transition out of the fleet. But I don't think it's... So, so I think that's sticking around for longer than you think, Dan. Yeah, I mean, I just want to play devil's advocate a bit. I feel yeah. like he says that, but then Qatar Airways is still sending like A350 900s to Heathrow. So yes, capacity, the A380 unlocks capacity, but it's not like they're maximizing capacity on many of the frequencies in relation to what they could, while Etihad sometimes now has four daily A380s to London. So, you yeah. know, Emirates, of course, the smallest so plane Qatar they have, 777 Qatar operate two to, to London a day. Yeah. So Etihad had four. And then I get the other A380s are flying basically to Australia. Yes. Yeah. For now. Um, for now. Yeah. And then, yeah. So I feel like, you know, British Airways. Also, the thing that airlines need to understand, which I, you know, got to give it to Carson Spore. He says it like it is very transparently about the A380 that it draws passengers in in every single cabin you see it's an a380 people are willing to pay a bit extra to fly an a380 over something yep. else for the additional comfort and you know the airlines that aren't seeing that benefit perhaps aren't marketing the benefits of the a380 well enough because we both agree it's such an incredible aircraft to fly as a passenger in any cabin now, many airlines have slightly outdated cabins, but look at Singapore Airlines, look at Emirates. It's just such a joy to fly. And airlines could do more to capitalize on it because mm -hmm. it's just, it is a special plane that deserves to be around as long as possible, in my opinion. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. 
I have a question here from Moritz. He asks, this is interesting, speaking on the subject of Ryanair from previous episodes, yeah. uh, what do you think would be the smarter strategy for airlines? Being strict on the maximum allowable measurements of hand luggage, but liberal okay. on weight, like BA, he says, or vice versa, being strict on the weight, but liberal on the size, like Emirates. I guess this is in his experience. What our what are our thoughts? I think it's more sensible to be to implement measures on the size rather than on the weight, because I think realistically, most passengers are not bringing on board cabin bags that are weighing more than 10 kg. Yeah. So I just think that it's not something that is an industry problem. What is an industry problem is if you've ever flown on an Italian flight and they board with about 15 bags. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah, be be strict on the quantity, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And not having like something that's ridiculously sized. I wouldn't say airlines should specifically measure or weigh carry-ons because, look, if you have one piece of carry-on luggage, as you said, it can only weigh so much. Most people... Mm -hmm are not filling their carry-ons with gold bars. There's clothes and there's maybe a laptop and some other stuff in there. There's liquid restrictions, which mean people can't, you know, bring huge, heavy things anyway. So yeah. what happens when there's a weight limit, airlines just, people just end up checking that in instead, putting it in their checked luggage, yeah. you know, having to add a checked bag. So it's not benefiting the airline in any real way by restricting the size and number of pieces they can make boarding more effective they can it eliminates a lot of problems in that sense yeah, yeah. i agree xavier asks and i hope i've pronounced his name correctly apologies if i haven't he says enjoying the podcast so much i wanted to ask you about your thoughts when it comes to bidding for an upgrade what would you think is a good bid to upgrade from economy to premium economy on a transatlantic flight from New York to London. Hmm. That's an interesting one. So $200, from, I would say. So that's that's so funny. So in my head, I was thinking $250. Yeah. So we're aligned. Yeah. 200 that's, 250 Like I would say that to premium economy and then five to $600 to business is yeah. about the going rate. Let us know how you get on. Let us know if that secures your upgrade. I have a question here that is from, let's see, I have a question here that is from Jan. He says, hi, Alex, I'm a huge fan of your podcast and Dan's. Oh, so it's mine. <laughs> I love that we have separate podcasts. <laughs> yep. No, I, I think he's very smart how he's written it. I think he, he recognizes there's a host and, and a co-host. Anyway, he says, <laughs> Which is uh, you. I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. Let it go. Okay. You <laughs> called me on Friday morning at 8.30. You have, are in no position to talk. He says, uh, I'm a huge fan of your podcast and Dan's, and I thoroughly enjoy every episode. I have a question regarding the current stake of airline capacities. It's evident that airfare costs have skyrocketed due to significant demand, but it seems that airlines still have a considerable number of planes not in operation. A holdover from the pandemic era, if I'm not mistaken. Could you shed some light on why airlines haven't returned all available aircraft to service to capitalize on current demand and potentially moderate ticket prices thank you for providing some insights on this and for the outstanding work you and dan continue to do sending cheers from sydney cheers to you in sydney thank Thanks, you for a great mate. question well let's do i mean that's a very interesting one let's look at etihad they are a prime example of an airline that are still umming and ahhing about their a380s but at the same time speaking about demand yeah so you have you have the capacity, in fact, you have the aircraft with the most capacity on earth sitting there. Why not do something with it? What do you think the reasons are behind that? <laughs> I mean, the first airline that came to my mind with, with this question is Cathay Pacific that still has so many grounded yes. aircraft making really high profits for the first time in since years before COVID even. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's just a way of controlling supply and demand and controlling price, in my opinion. Of course, they can greatly increase capacity if they want. But for any business, it's about finding that sweet spot where you're not, you know, offering too much. So you have to charge less, but you're offering that perfect amount where you can maximize your revenue. That's ultimately what it's about. 
Yeah. And a lot of the time, many of those airlines, because of the way in which they are building back their profits, some I have seen are, are pretty reluctant to start paying for the heavy, heavy maintenance that many of these jets require. And so it's something that they're putting off. You know, they know that they can get by with other aircraft. And so maybe they're not paying for the heaviest maintenance check to begin on an aircraft that has been grounded since 2020. And it's something that they're putting off. I think that's true to some carriers. I mean, look at the number of aircraft that are still on the ground in Bangkok with Thai Airways, for example. It's, you know, and they're just not in a position to even begin addressing those. They, They have started come on, it's 2024, we're approaching summer, and it still looks like an aircraft boneyard when you land at, uh, at Bangkok. Yeah, but I, th- I think we just have to look at it like this. Airlines are, th- the pandemic was kind of like a shakeout. It let them remove most things and start from scratch. So true, true. comparing it to prior to the pandemic, for example, looking at Cathay Pacific, you can't just look at that and see why are they not doing the same thing? Well, because they were unprofitable, same with Etihad, for example. So better, in my opinion, to slowly increase and see, all right, where can we go that makes sense? Where can we progress and still make profits rather than just be like, all right, let's go at 100%. So yeah, their flights might be full, but they still need to proceed with caution to maintain the new delicate profitability that these airlines have managed to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. And let's let's quickly, that brings us on to the last question of the episode. It's from Marco. He says, hey, Alex, continuing to love the podcast. As fellow lovers of One World, I wanted to know what your and Dan's thoughts are on Cathay Pacific and what specifically your thoughts on the recent teaser of the Aria Suite. Keep up the mm. amazing work. He says, P.S. I work for Stansted Airport, so if there's anything I can do to stop you shuddering at the thought of us, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> no way. Wow. Oh, Marco. Yeah, I already feel better about Stance there. Thank you for your I'm message. Am, I'm amazed that Marco still listens, considering how many times you have spoken ill of Stance <laughs> Well, at least I'm real and I have done it on the podcast. Heaven forbid <laughs> they knew what you say off the podcast. Anyway, <laughs> what answer the are question. are you making up? I haven't been to Stance in the so long. The Aria Suite. <laughs> Aria Suite in Cafe. Uh, what do you think? I mean, listen... A few years ago, this would have been so, so exciting. But these days, an airline announced... Yeah, I mean, these days, an airline announcing a reverse herringbone with a door is like, okay, another one. Thank you, next. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. it's kind of that. I agree. Well, look, we're going to get to more of your questions next week. I'm also conscious that... Didn't I read out a list of names last week of the questions that I will get to this week? And I don't think I did them because I've put them in a separate folder. So if you're in this list of names, I'm now going to go back and make sure, okay, we're going to get to them. I think also we will be, well, I'll, I'll discuss this with you in a minute, Dan, off the podcast. But I, I'm, I'm thinking we do an entire episode of only Q&A. Mm. So that way we, we, you can get in touch with us. Let's do it for next week, okay? We might do a tiny bit of headliny things depending on how the news agenda goes, but we are going to dedicate almost the entire episode to Q&A. So this is your chance. Send in your scenarios, not just your questions. Send in your moral scenarios, your dilemmas. Were you in the right when you told the lady with the baby that she can't have your window seat <laughs> because you had pre-booked it? We're going to tell you if you're right or not. <laughs> Let us know your your thoughts of, you know, are you planning your summer travels and you're concerned about A or B? Are you wondering... Uh, where you should be investing your shares in either <laughs> manufacturers. We will because not we have... be answering <laughs> this. <laughs> Basically, come to us with your Q&A. We're going to get to that list of names I said. We're going to get to those that we didn't get to this week. And we're going to get to even more of you as we're going to dedicate. And as wide ranging, the better. If you have questions about something that's happening where you live in Peru or in LA or in Gothenburg. No, sorry, Gothenburg's not allowed. Get in touch with us and we're gonna we're gonna get to it. And with that, I think we sign off on today's episode. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, guys. We will see you next week on air. Bye bye. See you later. 